Good morning, everybody. My name is uh, Willem van der Brugge, and I'm the Secretary General of the Confederation of European Probation, CEP. And we are delighted to have you here to participate in this CEP webinar uh, on mental health in probation. But before we start, uh, please let me introduce briefly our organization. And the Confederation of European Probation is a non-political, non-governmental organization which brings together probation services from around Europe. CEP currently has 35 countries in membership, of which are 25 EU member states, large and small, new and old, from the north and south and the east and west. In 1981, so 41 years ago, it was the number of foreign national prisoners in Europe that gave 11 members, at that time Western European countries, cause to join forces and found CEP. Nowadays, CEP is the single largest European network organization for the sector of probation and community justice, with the capacity to reach probation staff at both a managerial and an executive level, so practitioners and middle managers. It includes academic and researchers in probation from all over Europe in its network, both as individuals and as member universities and research institutes. CEP promotes pan-European cooperation in the development and delivery of community sanctions and measures. All the activities of CEP, from conferences and workshops, expert groups, online events, publications such as Probation in Europe, the CEP website and newsletters are targeted towards the probation sector across all European jurisdictions, specifically towards the member organizations. And CEP has its headquarters in Europe. But let's go to the topic of today, mental health in probation. We know mental health in probation, it is there. But what do we know about mental health? And do we know enough about it? Research has shown that the prevalence of various mental health problems among people under probation is high when compared to general population. And the aim of this international webinar is to address recent mental health care research and practices, as well as different kinds of treatment approaches in different European settings. Initially, uh, as some of you will know, our plan was to organize a mental health workshop this week in Dublin. Unfortunately, too many colleagues were unable to attend. So that's why we decided to go online and organize this webinar. That's why we asked Mark uh, Wilson, director of the Irish Probation Service, and CP President Jerry McNally, uh, and assistant director of the Irish Probation Service, to say some opening words. The webinar consists of, uh, and you've seen the program, of three presentations delivered by speakers from different European jurisdictions who will talk about various aspects ethics and mental health, the Council of Europe white paper on mental health in prison and probation, and suicide in probation. Uh, for today, we have three eminent speakers on ethics and mental health in probation, Professor Damien Smith, consultant forensic psychiatrist at the Mountjoy and Cloverhill prison and lecturer at the Trinity College in Dublin, on the Council of Europe white paper on mental health in prison and probation. Mr. Jorge Montero, Head of Programs and Projects Department of the Prison and Probation Service in Portugal, and on Suicide in Probation, Mr. Jake Phillips, Lecturer in Criminology at the Sheffield Union Hallam University in the UK. Good to know is that after the three presentations, we take time for some questions and answers. Please ask your questions via the Q&A function, and you will find the Q&A button and on the toolbar at the bottom of your screen. And CP policy officer Anna Esquerra Roqueta will keep track on the Q&A. Also good to know is that all sessions will be recorded and that we will publish the webinar materials on the CP website and media for your reference. Enough for now. Uh, I hand over to Mark J. Wilson, director of the Irish Probation Service. Um, Mark, the floor, or should I say the screen is yours. Willem, uh, thank you very much <clears throat> and good morning everyone from Dublin. Uh, I'm delighted to say a few words at the start of today's webinar and of course it is a shame that we're not all together in Dublin but 
uh, we do look forward to welcoming you to Dublin it, at a future time, hopefully uh, in the not too distant future. I'm looking forward to hearing from colleagues in Ireland and across Europe this morning on the important topic of mental health and probation. Uh, as we all know, <clears throat> in the modern world, uh, this is an increasingly common issue of concern and certainly it is particularly true for probation services and the broader criminal justice sector. As Willem has said, the uh, prevalence of mental health we all know is, is disproportionately higher uh, than the general population amongst those that we work with, uh, but also uh, the, the complexities of uh, the needs and the circumstances of those that we, that we engage with often create further barriers to engagement with mental health services. Uh, but building on our understanding of the complex relationship between mental health and offending is, uh, is critical if we are to achieve better outcomes uh, and support people to uh, better pathways and into recovery uh, and thereby hopefully reducing the rates of reoffending. Here in Ireland, uh, our, our government has uh, had a high level target uh, to look at the issues of uh, mental health and addiction within those that come in contact with the criminal justice system. And indeed our minister, Helen McEntee, uh, established a, a, a task force looking at that very issue last year. <coughs> um, our speaker this morning, Professor Damien Smith and I both sit on the task force, which brings together experts from the justice and the health sectors to uh, consider the specific issues of the interface between uh, health and criminal justice. That report uh, from the task force will be published later this year and will have a comprehensive implementation plan attached to it. And I do think that is one which could help us all further understand the difficulties and potential solutions to this complex area. <clears throat> in the probation service in Ireland, uh, we instigated research, which was published last year, conducted by Dr. Christina Power, uh, to provide evidence of that which we already knew that indeed there was this higher prevalence of mental health issues amongst those we supervise. And indeed Dr. Power's report indicated that at least 40% of those under our supervision presented with symptoms indicative of at least one mental health problem in comparison to 18.5% of the general population. And of those 40% that uh, was uh, identified by Dr. Power, they further uh, had complications relating to either alcohol and drug abuse, difficult family relationships, or uh, accommodation instability. Again, uh, reinforcing that which we, uh, many of us already uh, uh, strongly believed. <clears throat> the research has fed into the task force on mental health and addiction that I've referred to earlier, and is also guiding a probation practice in Ireland, and will continue to do so in the years ahead. So to conclude, uh, today's session is very timely from the point of view of our practice. Uh, we are very keen to learn more and to share our learning uh, today and into the future. Uh, and the importance of the CEP network is so critical in this difficult area. Uh, I'd like to thank Jerry McNally, uh, who will be speaking shortly uh, who as CEP president. But Jerry in Ireland has been instrumental in encouraging colleagues here in Ireland to look at this area and to participate in this network. And I hope Jerry it will continue long into the future. So again, Willem and Anna and to other CEP colleagues, thank you very much for organizing the session today. We will welcome you to Dublin on a different day. And I look forward to the insightful session ahead. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Mark, for your kind opening words. I now like to give the floor to CEP President Jerry McNally. Thank you, Willem, and thank you, Mark. And I would like just basically to echo much of what Willem and um, Mark have already said. Mental health is at the center of probation work. It's a key factor in marginalization. It's a key factor in social deprivation, and it can be an aggravating factor in helping people recover and to restore their, to get back to their position in life and have a strong future. It particularly requires multi-agency and cross-agency working. And I think CEP really wants to highlight and to support that development. It's not something that probation can solve or resolve on its own. It needs a partnership with the people on probation, but it needs, above all, 
partnership with government and with other services. And I think th this is something we will have to lead on and drive across Europe. CEP also wants to work on a pan-European with both national researchers, but also with bodies like the European Commission and the Council of Europe in this area. And I think it's something that, again, we need to do together. CEP is also uh, working with our members to basically commission research to develop skills and to work further on this. However, this seminar today is part of that program of both consciousness raising, awareness raising, and also building those connections between the people across Europe on this topic to share knowledge and to learn together and to develop expertise. So I do think this is an important event which we will um, drive and encourage people further with. So I would certainly encourage your participation. I would hope you will um, find it valuable and I hope you will actually as well ask questions and make comments in the Q&A at the end because it's through our cooperation and joint working and sharing of ideas that we will learn and develop services better for both people on probation and for our wider communities. So without further delay, I want to um, hand it back to Willem and to open the seminar, the webinar. Thank you. Well, thank you, Jerry, for your introduction. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce the first speaker. It's Dr. Damien Smith. He is consultant forensic psychiatrist at the Mountjoy and Cloverhill prison. And as I mentioned before, also lecturer at the Trinity College in Dublin. Uh, Dr. Smith conducted research and wrote numerous articles on mental health problems in judicial institutions and related issues such as homelessness. Uh, one of his latest reports uh, I could find was about uh, psychiatric court reports and uh, the diversion outcomes in a remand prison over the last three years. And um, what struck me, uh, it was mentioned in the report, there has been a notable increase in requests for psychiatric reports from district courts for persons remanded to Ireland's main prison service, Cloverhill. Um, I think that's an interesting uh, conclusion. Um, Professor da uh, Dr. Damien Smith, whenever you are ready, the floor is yours. Um, thank you very much for the, the kind introductions. I particularly like that you referred to me as a professor. Uh, <laughs> I must confess that I'm not I'm not a professor just yet, but uh, um, but I am I am a consultant forensic psychiatrist working here in Dublin, and it's a great privilege and honour to be asked to speak to you today. Um, I heard about various and many different exotic locations, um, and it's really, really an honor to speak with, with you all this morning um, from here in, in Ireland. So I've been asked to speak today about uh, ethics and mental health and probation, um, but obviously I'm, I, I'm not, I don't work in probation. Um, I'm a prison psychiatrist. Um, so I'd, I'd like to give my perspective um, and maybe touch upon some of the shared principles, values and ethics that we have uh, among uh, across both disciplines. So this morning, uh, I'm going to speak firstly about medical ethics and some of uh, the ethical dilemmas that may face me and others working in prison psychiatry. I'll give my perspective. Uh, as a prison psychiatrist. Uh, I'm going to focus mainly on release planning and interagency collaboration, uh, touching upon some work I've recently done with colleagues in Mountjoy Prison uh, and Clover Hill Prison. I may also, if I have time, provide a case example for a person who has benefited from this uh, interagency collaboration. Um, and then we'll have a discussion and questions at the end. So firstly, uh, as I mentioned, I'm a medical doctor um, and I trained here in Dublin. And in my first year in medicine, uh, I was taught about medical ethics. And there are four main pillars of medical ethics. Uh, the first of which is respect for uh, our patient's autonomy. Um, 
And this is, uh, you know, treating them and their beliefs and ideas with respect. And um, it also brings into, uh, uh, into account uh, a, a person having capacity to consent to various uh, interventions or treatments that you um, wish to prescribe or, or provide as a doctor. Uh, beneficence uh, is doing good for our patients um, and non-maleficence -malefic is doing no harm for our patients. And then maybe uh, most pertinent today is the idea of justice. Um, and that, that is treating all patients fairly and equally within the law. Now, keeping each of these principles in mind, um, you may see how some uh, doctors and psychiatrists may have ethical kind of dilemmas in working in prisons, um, given that prisons may cause potential harm and distress uh, especially to vulnerable prisoners, uh, such as those with, with mental illness. However, we know that prison populations uh, have a much greater prevalence of major mental illness than their peers in the general population. Uh, and this particular image is taken from a magazine in America, um, and it's a, an image taken from Cook County Jail which has been referred to as one of the largest psychiatric hospitals in the world, having uh, many thousands of inmates at any one time. A recent meta-analysis by uh, Fazel uh, showed that rates of severe mental illness, namely psychosis, are four times that of the general population. And he also found that there are high rates of comorbid substance misuse problems in prison populations. Uh, this was consistent with the findings of another more recent meta-analysis um, of prevalence studies here in Ireland by uh, my colleague, Professor Galati. And he showed that again, rates of psychosis were found to be 3.6% or four times that of the general population. Rates of other comorbid and complex social uh, needs uh, were present too, with rates of homelessness being uh, on average 17% across these studies. Again, rates of substance misuse were high. And it's no surprise then that these high prevalence rates translate from prison through to the community where probation clients have been found both internationally and nationally to have high rates of symptoms indicative of a mental health disorder. Uh, Bruker's uh, study in the UK found that rates of psychotic or symptoms indicative of psychotic illnesses were as much as 11%. Again, rates of substance misuse were high. Um, and in Ireland, as uh, Mark touched upon in his introduction, um, Christina Power uh, performed prevalence studies and found again that rates of symptoms indicative of mental disorders were high. So, you know, we know that, uh, again, this, these kind of very vulnerable uh, and marginalized groups um, warrant our attention and care. Uh, so this allows us to overcome any ethical conflict that we might have visiting and treating people in custody. Um, as a, a practicing medical practitioner in Ireland, um, I am subject to a, a guide of professional contact and ethics, um, which allows me to be registered with the Irish Medical Council. As part of that, um, I'm bound to certain um, guiding principles and values. Um, these are shown uh, on your screen uh, as the pillars of professionalism, uh, and they're inspired by those four pillars of medical ethics. Um, and as we'll, we'll see as I go on through the, the presentation, 
uh, I think these principles and values are shared by my colleagues in probation. Particularly of note, um, we're going to touch upon the importance of partnership uh, and particularly cross-agency partnership uh, and collaboration and the importance of good communication with colleagues um, while respecting uh, a patient's confidentiality. Um, we're also going to speak about the importance of advocacy uh, in, in providing the best possible care for uh, mentally ill prisoners uh, and, and indeed probation clients. So some ethical dilemmas may arise for a psychiatrist both in prisons and in the community. Uh, and again, hopefully we can, we can resolve these uh, through the, the, the talk. Some of which refer to the respect for the person's autonomy. Uh, if a person is capacitous, then they're deemed uh, to be able to make bad decisions some of which we might not agree with. Um, but it is important to assess someone's capacity to provide consent, particularly for a treatment or, for example, sharing information. Because as a doctor, if I breach a strict code of conduct around the sharing of information without a person's consent, if they're capacitous, then I could be subject to disciplinary action by the medical council. Um, there's also some conflicts that might arise for psychiatrists uh, when liaising with probation, um, because keeping in mind beneficence, non-maleficence, we may be concerned that if we disclose certain information that our patients' uh, trust may be breached and we may subject them to uh, a risk of further detention or re-imprisonment. Um, so, I'll move on now just to talk more about my perspective as a prison psychiatrist and the context in which I work. So I work part-time in a sentence prison called Mountjoy Prison in Dublin, Ireland, and part-time in another prison, a remand prison uh, called Clover Hill. But firstly about Mountjoy. So Mountjoy uh, is a medium security, all-male sentence prison with the capacity of close to 800 uh, prisoners. And as of Wednesday last week, it was a 97% capacity, and this would not be unusual for Mountjoy. As you can tell from the facade, it is not a modern building. It's in fact, Ireland's oldest penal institution. It first received uh, committals in 1850, so they came in, as you can see from this artist's impression, on, on horse-drawn uh, carriages. Um, and around this time, uh, when it was opened, um, we were under uh, British rule at the time. Um, this was Victorian-era Britain. Um, and Mountjoy was opened uh, as uh, the first stop uh, on a male prisoners uh, transportation to distant far-flung penal colonies in Australia. And uh, as you can tell from this headline um, taken from the Irish Times newspaper, um, some of the charges were incredibly minor that resulted in people being sentenced to transportation and taken from their families to, to these far-flung places. one of which was Van Diemen's Land, uh, which is now known as Tasmania, uh, off the coast of, 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 the, of Australia. Um, but now uh, we, sorry, uh, but now, sorry if there was interference there, uh, but now uh, we know that uh, there is a more ethical approach uh, to uh, care for prisoners within Mountjoy Prison. And I'll talk briefly about the evolution of our service there. So in 2006, we first provided in-reach mental health services to the prison. This was based upon a medical model with a doctor visiting uh, the prison on a weekly basis uh, and providing mainly prescription and medication uh, for those that would accept it. In December 2010, we established a high support unit, which was a, a reserved area of the prison uh, made up of 10 beds 
uh, for those who are vulnerable and mentally ill. Here's some images of it when it was uh, brand new. Um, I continue to see people in this uh, part of the prison on a weekly basis. Uh, and unfortunately, it's not quite as shiny um, and, and new as it is in these pictures. But as you can see, it's pretty much a prison setting uh, and not a hospital or therapeutic setting. But we realized that you know, despite providing uh, enhanced care for those with mental health problems within the prison walls, uh, we know that when they left the prison, uh, they're free, faced with a number of risks um, in the post-release period, including uh, a 12.5-fold increase in mortality by all causes, uh, one of which is a drug overdose. There's also an increased risk of suicide within this uh, period um, and an increased risk of reoffending. And when trying to address this risk um, and provide better support uh, and as our patients transition to the community, we took into account um, the UN standard minimum rules for the treatment of prisoners and these were initially adopted by the UN Congress, Congress on the Prevention of Crime and Treatment of Offenders in 1955, but they were revised uh, in 2015, and uh, this version was named the Nelson Mandela Rules. And particularly of interest to us in uh, planning for the transition back to the community was Rule 107, which stated that from the beginning of a prisoner's sentence, consideration should be given to his or her future after release. And it highlighted the importance of maintaining and establishing relations with persons or agencies outside the prison, uh, as may promote the prisoner's rehabilitation. And this will include mental health services in the community, family, but also probation services. Uh, in doing some research for today, uh, I, I, I was very interested in this particular report uh, uh, written by Charlie Brooker and colleagues uh, for the HM uh, in the UK, for the H Her Majesty's Inspectorate of Probation. And it was focused on uh, mental health in probation and maximizing mental health outcomes for people under supervision. And drawing upon some of the, 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 the things that uh, Brooker highlighted that can maximize positive mental health outcomes, uh, this particular one was of, of interest to me, uh, given our work in Mountjoy, and that was increasing integration between services. Because when developing a plan to improve transition, back to the community for mentally ill prisoners that we saw in Mountjoy, we focused on interagency collaboration and integration, because as a person returns to the community from prison, they may have access to multiple different supports, both within the prison and the community. But uh, sometimes these can be fragmented. Uh, there may have been no communication between them or inadequate communication. Therefore, people can fall through the cracks of these supports. So with this in mind, we established a program that we called the PREP program or pre-release planning program in March of 2015. So if you want to read more about this in detail, you can access this particular paper online. It's in an open access journal um, and was published in 2018. And it describes the, the first two years of the pre-release planning program for sentence mentally disorder offenders in Mountjoy Prison. And the goals of the program uh, uh, really focused on enshrining uh, some of the ethical principles that we've talked about so far, mainly integration, collaboration, communication, and advocacy. By building trusting 
relationships with mentally ill prisoners in the pre-release period, advocating for supports, uh, reintegrating them with community-based mental health services and other supports, and particularly focusing on some of the most vulnerable people that we saw that were homeless and mentally ill, and we made efforts to try and obtain accommodation for them upon release. Um, the PrEP program then uh, was based around, again, a mental health in-reach team made up of uh, psychiatrists and also uh, community mental health nursing staff. But we felt that we needed extra expertise. So we brought on board a forensic mental health social worker to help us uh, provide uh, the pre-release planning program. So the role and interventions of the program were to liaise with mental health services in the community in the pre-release period, advocate for supports, work with families, um, and then develop a, a pre-release plan, which took into account each of these various reports um, that the person would require to ease their transition back to the community. Um, this is our current team. As you can see, it's, it's actually decreased in number. So we have quite limited resources. So the program is focused on providing support to those with the greatest need so that is those with very severe mental illnesses and complex needs. One important aspect of the program was to get all of the various reports around the governor's boardroom table in Mountjoy prison in the pre-release period uh, to develop a very robust release plan. So these are some of the various uh, agencies and supports that would have attended uh, these uh, pre-release meetings. As you can see, the patient themselves often attended as did family members and probation. Very briefly, um, you know, this is some of the results for the first year. So 43 people on our caseload were released back to the community. Most of them suffered from a psychotic illness. Uh, most of them had comorbid substance abuse problems and a history of self-harm. Most had previous contact with mental health services, but had disengaged. And approximately half were charged with violent offences. Many of them were charged with very minor uh, offences. So I, I won't bore you too much on, on the results, but we did find that the level of healthcare support at the time of committal versus that of uh, the day of release uh, had improved uh, following the intervention of the program. In terms of accommodation outcomes, 50% of our, uh, the people seen were homeless at the time of committal, and 12% of whom were rough sleeping prior to committal. But following the intervention of the program, no prisoners were released to rough sleeping. Uh, the blue bars on this chart represent at the time of committal, the red bars at the time of release. So you can see that most people were able to go to um, short uh, to medium term hostel placements and more long term hostel placements. Um, and no individuals were released to rough sleeping. In terms of re imprisonment, which might be of interest to you, um, approximately 50% were returned to prison during the two years of the study period. 35% uh, of uh, the total sample were subject to supervision order by probation services upon release, and six of these were recommitted within the two-year period. In Ireland, recidivism rates for male prisoners within three years um, uh, of their release um, are, and I think my screen has been covered, uh, or 62%, uh, according to the Central Statistics Office in 2010. Two thirds of reoffending occurred within the six months of, of release, highlighting again the importance of intervening in this, this post release period. So, to conclude uh, from the, the PrEP program study, this interagency service innovation supported mentally ill prisoners in accessing improved care and accommodation in the post-release period, but many remained homeless uh, 
However, none were released to rough sleeping. But could we do better? Well, particularly uh, in terms of those who are homeless, we thought we could. And I looked to work out being involved in a Clover Hill prison, which is a remand prison. And in the context of Ireland's homeless crisis, um, which unfortunately is ongoing, um, some homeless mentally ill prisoners, when released, find it particularly difficult to access healthcare. That might be because when they're in the community, they're a poor insight into their illnesses, engage poorly with available services. They might relapse into substance abuse very quickly and be intoxicated. They may be transient and move between many different locations, struggling to engage with uh, community mental health services that are based upon a person's address. And all of this can render them uh, invisible uh, to the available community supports. So again, to compare them, I won't bore you too much in the details here, but I will provide these slides uh, after the talk. But these individuals seen uh, in Cloverhill Roman Prison, I did a, 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 a study just to look at how they compared with the non-homeless people on our caseload over a, th a three year period. And we found that 40% of all committals seen by us in Cloverhill were homeless. And in comparison to their non-homeless uh, uh, fellow prisoners uh, seen by us, they tended to be more likely to suffer from psychosis um, and more likely to be repeatedly uh, remanded to custody and more likely to be charged with minor offences. So an unmet need was identified. To address this in Clover Hill, we brought on board uh, a housing support worker uh, who had worked with a homeless and housing uh, organization in Dublin um, called Hale Housing. And they joined our service in 2014. If you want to read more about the pilot, uh, the, the outcomes um, of uh, the first couple of years of this intervention, you can read about them in this uh, Royal College of Psychiatrists publication uh, in uh, the winter of 2016. As you can see, it was close to Christmas. Um, again, I can share this uh, article with you if necessary afterwards, if you're interested. But very briefly, housing outcomes improved for all of those seen by the housing support worker uh, during that period. Uh, we had much bigger numbers uh, in a remand setting, which can often be, be much busier than, than a sentence prison uh, due to the short term duration uh, of most romance. So in October 2021, we enhanced our service in Mountjoy to add a housing support worker uh, to the team. In terms of a case example, I might not have much time to go through this. Um, but this is a person who was seen by our team in Mount Troy Prison. He's 39, homeless, had a diagnosis of psychosis, uh, schizophrenia, complicated by substance abuse. He also had a history of suicide attempts. So quite a complex mental health history and particularly vulnerable. Uh, he was well known to homeless services, community mental health services and probation services. He was a frequent flyer prisoner having had 25 committals since 2001. Given how many committals he had, uh, you could take it as a given that the offences were, were minor. So he first became homeless in 2011 um, and had multiple placements which broke down quite quickly due to chaotic, his chaotic presentation in the community. During his most recent committal to Mountjoy Prison, he was identified as a suitable person for a pre-release planning program. He was introduced to our new housing support worker in, two, in October 2021. Um, he was able to identify where he would like to stay in the community. The housing support worker made contact with the local housing department of the county council and local homeless services. Community probation, homeless services and these, the county council were invited to attend a pre-release planning meeting uh, in the prison. 
And from that meeting, we put in place this holistic release plan involving all of the available supports. We were able to get him a single room placement in a secure, high supported service with a key worker. And so that's a high supported hostel, a homeless hostel uh, in the location that he desired. Uh, and they have 24 hours, uh, uh, 24 hour, seven staff on site. Um, and, and that person did very well in the placement. Uh, and despite coming back into prison, unfortunately, because he had some outstanding charges, uh, we've been able to get a guarantee from that particular service that they will keep his bed uh, for, for the time that he is released again. So just to, to finish up, um, prisoners and probation clients have increased rates of mental health problems and complex needs. The limited resources, prison psychiatry adopts an ethical approach which aims to address the needs of the most vulnerable and marginalized, namely prisoners with severe mental illness and complex needs such as homelessness and substance abuse. We adopt a number of principles and values which uh, I know colleagues in probation share. And I would argue that prison may present an opportunity to engage these hard to reach individuals in a place where they have advocates, where they can be on medication, where they're found and located and can be provided with an address upon release and also when, where they're sober. Uh, and this can make these individuals visible to supports within the community. So I'll just skip through this, but I can come back to it. Uh, if I have time, I'd like to acknowledge the team uh, in both Mountjoy and Clover Hill. Uh, and thank you again for this opportunity to speak with you. And I'd be happy to address any questions later and apologies if I ran over time. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Damien, for this very interesting presentation. I think uh, uh, everybody thought it was uh, uh, very valuable. Um, for me, um, I, I think we recognize lots of, of issues, even if you, you mentioned I'm from prison. I think in probation, we will find the same issues and the same challenges. Um, you mentioned articles, which you'd like to share. If you can send us the links, we can share them with the participants. That would be very nice. So for now, thank you. As you mentioned, we will uh, discuss uh, uh, and answer questions later at the end of the presentations. So if you're okay with that, I'd like now to introduce the next speaker, which is uh, Jorge Montero. He is the head of the Department of the Ministry of Justice, Prison and Probation Services in Portugal. And Jorge is a licensed clinical psychologist with a long track record in the Portuguese prison administration. And currently he is working on the so-called white paper on the management of offenders with mental health disorders in prison and probation in Europe, which is conducted by the Penological Council for Cooperation, the PCCP uh, on the Council of Europe. Uh, a useful and challenging exercise, which for me underlines the importance of this topic in our work. Jorge, you can take the floor. Thank you, Willem. Um, first of all, um, I would like to thank the CEP Organization Committee for the, um, this very kind invitation and the opportunity to be here and to uh, reflect and to present some of the results um, of, the, of this uh, work, this research that has been been uh, conducted by the PCCP working group um, of the Council of Europe and also on behalf of the of this PCCP working group um, I would like to um, to thank also CEP for the collaboration um, provided through all the um, through all the work that it's been done um, and um, through all the, the, the research um, and um, the send out of the questionnaires through all the probation services. And so um, to, to address this topic of the mental health in prison and probation uh, situation and the developments of the, 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 the research and the development of the white paper of the Council of Europe, um, I, I planned here uh, two or three uh, main ideas um, in order to, to 
um, to address this topic. So uh, I prepared and I thought that only for um, a framework, uh, a frame of, um, of the statues of this, uh, uh, this issue, um, what do we know? So um, some figures of, um, of the research already uh, uh, known in this field. Um, a, second, a second topic is what did we find um, under the survey of, of the, on the mental health disorders um, conducted by C, conjointly by CP and the Council of Europe, the PCCP working group. And what do we face? So what are the challenges for the future um, in addressing this, this topic? So um, as, as already mentioned by Professor Damien uh, before, um, there are some research, recent research that uh, um, can show us what is the state of the art in terms of the uh, most common needs and uh, um, situation of the mentally disordered in, inside prison or under the probation uh, supervision. And so the research that we conducted under a, a, a project, international project, uh, we conducted a, a, a literature review and we found um, that this is a, uh, this is a coherent um, findings of all the research that we uh, revised that in terms of prevalence of mental illness in prison context, about 4% of the inmates, uh, both males and females, present some symptoms of uh, severe mental disorders, psychotic illness, um, around 4% of the prisoners both male and female present this, um, this uh, severe psychotic disease. 10% of the male inmates struggle with the major depression and 47% of them have an antisocial personality disorder out of 65% with personality disorders. 12% um, of female prisoners show signs of having a major depression while 21% have an antisocial personality disorder out of 42% with personality disorders. Um, in terms of um, the, uh, these figures uh, compared to the child population, we also know and we heard from professional Professor uh, Damien that um, this meta-analysis uh, confirmed that uh, inmates show higher rates of mental illness when compared to the general population and that emotional disorders rates can increase according to the stage of the imprisonment. So depending on the phase of the stage of the imprisonment, the disorders can um, increase um, and show more severe symptoms. Research also shows that during the first week of imprisonment, emotional disorders can be prevalent in almost 90% of the cases. And after six months, these symptoms still remain on more than half of the prison population. And after trial, several inmates arrive in prison with previously detected mental health disorders, importing them to a whole new context, which um, improves and um, increases the risk. What do we know about the prison environment impacts on the, on the, on the mentally disordered uh, prisoners and not only, but also um, on the, the, gener the general population. So we know that inmates with existing mental disorder area at further are at further risk of acute mental harm as they have fewer resources to cope in a, an environment lacking in privacy. This risk is higher um, in inmates with depressive symptoms previously to, to the imprisonment who may become suicidal and psychotic due to an increased emotional deterioration. Also prisoners without any mental problems prior to imprisonment may develop a range of mental disabilities in prison where they do not feel safe, dormitories are overcrowded and staff not trained to deal with their specific psychotic social, psychosocial support requirements can aggravate these symptoms. Um, in terms of care and level of care and uh, the, the healthcare, um, mental health care inside prison is also another very important topic to address this, this issue. So when we analyze prison health care issues, we often 
find that the principle of equivalence of care is often referred, highlighting the importance of prison services providing the same level of quality of the basic level of service um, as in the community, including mental health. And the principle might be achieved through different levels uh, or means, through a prison health staff training on mental health, through regular visits from a community mental health team and through access to health care services provided outside prison. And so with this uh, very brief uh, um, overview about the current state of the art in terms of the, the most important topics uh, around this, this issue or mental health disorders in prison and in probation context, um, what did we find um, uh, on the survey that was conducted, as I mentioned, conjointly with CEP and PCCP Working Group of Council of Europe? And this, this work was done by myself and um, with, conjointly with my esteemed colleague, Charlie, Professor Charlie Brooker from the University of London, that only for, reason, for um, the reason of the uh, overlapping of agendas, he could not be here today. Um, but this work was done and still is done, uh, still is being doing, uh, being done with with him, uh, conjointly with him. So this survey, the Council of Europe um, started in was uh, sent out to all the prison and probation administrations uh, in February 2021 and was um, open uh, for replies until July um, uh, of last year. Um, so two, two questionnaires were designed, one for prison and one for probation, because as we all know, the context um, may present some differences. And so two separate uh, um, questionnaires were, uh, were designed. And um, the, the principal aim of these um, two questionnaires were, were, was to elicit government policies and practical approaches to mental health disorders in prison and in probation services. So this was a first attempt to, um, to address this issue. It, it was also um, a way to put this uh, subject on the, the political agenda of the, um, of the whole the Euro jurisdiction, European jurisdiction um, to, uh, um, to pay attention to this uh, situation and to look inside their own reality and their own context about the, the, the 19 questions that we asked in this survey. So the survey closed in uh, July 2021, and then uh, we had um, we had a long a long period of analyzing the, uh, the data, the information, and to uh, um, summarize all the conclusions. And um, this was done by me, myself and Professor Charlie Brooker, as I already mentioned. But not only we um, also had several meetings of the working the BCCP working group. And we had um, also the comments, we collect also comments uh, during these uh, working group sessions um, from representatives of CEP, Europris and ICPA. And we are now in the phase of integrating the comments of the um, uh, European Court of Human Rights and the Committee for the Profession of Torture that um, analyzed and sent us some very, very important and relevant contributions to this uh, document and that now is being revised and that we, um, we wish and we anticipate to, um, to conclude and to uh, disseminate this white paper until the end of the, the year, the, this year, 2022. So, but the main findings um, about this, um, this question are, and I'm just going to present uh, some of the results. I'm not going through the all 19 questions, but um, I just highlighted some um, of the findings. This, this, uh, this table um, represents the answers of the, of the, the question, how many, um, how many countries were delivering training, awareness training for the staff. And so here we found the first red alert in terms of comparison. We found that in prison context, 74% um, um, of the prison administration say 
and answered that they are providing at least a, le a basic level of awareness training for the staff, um, which contrasts with the 37% of the um, probation services that um, reply that they are uh, providing uh, uh, training. So this is a very important topic that will be addressed in the white paper, of course, but this is uh, just also to, um, to let us know um, and to have this uh, alert um, that uh, we need to um, invest in the training of staff, um, especially in the probation services. Um, estimation of prevalence. We talked about prevalences here, even today, Professor, Professor Damien also mentioned some prevalence, um, some research about prevalence, and this was not a consensual, a consensual topic. So we had answers that range from 0% to until 90%. For instance, in probation services, we had a range, a variety of answers between 2% and 90%. So this means that this needs further development. Uh, probably the, the understanding that the concept was understood differently by different jurisdictions was not clearly defined at, uh, at the beginning uh, with the questionnaire. But um, we, all, we, we found that the median um, uh, rate is around 15%, which means that prevalence um, may be underestimated um, in, the, in, this, in, in all the, the, the administrations, prison and probation administration. Nevertheless, it's an important topic to be developed further, to have further developments. Um, about the organizations that are providing mental care in prison and probation services. We found out that in prison services, uh, there, uh, most of the, of the administrations are providing themselves the, the mental health care, but they are, um, we are seeing an increased participation of the healthcare ministry inside the prison context and also the voluntary sector is also play, playing an important role in prison context. In probation services, out of 36 valid responses, we found that the bulk of mental health care provide, is provided outside probation with a resource of the, uh, the healthcare ministry or the healthcare services. Um, another uh, finding, uh, an answer to the question, when does screening for mental health problems take place in prison and in probation? So in prison, most of the countries have screen procedures established in the first phase of incarceration, in the phase of in intake and admission. So almost 80% of the prison establishment or the prison administration have screening for mental health procedures in this initial phase of the imprisonment. And in the, in the probation services, most screening takes place at the court stage in probation, although Prison is important too. So um, in, the, in the valid responses out of 36, 94% uh, uh, say that the, the screening for mental health occurs in the court uh, phase and then in prison, uh, 87, 86%. Um, another, another question was about how often are prisoners screened for mental health problems? Um, and uh, mainly, uh, and many countries stated that the screening for mental health problems are conducted at least once a year, um, which is uh, not the ideal situation, but still uh, shows that at least once a year, every prisoner um, is um, re-screened uh, uh, um, uh, regarding their mental, situ their mental disorder situation. And, uh, and who was who usually screens for um, does this screening uh, process it are mainly psychologists and psychiatrists, both in prison and in the probation services. Um, the, another question was about the level of care. As we mentioned before, this is also a very important topic, um, the, the situation and the level of care um, that is provided to these uh, individuals. And so in prison uh, uh, context, we asked how many jurisdictions or countries have special units to provide treatment to the detainees with psychiatric mental disorders. 
Um, and so 69% of the, of, the, of the prison administration um, replied that they have special or separate units to provide this care, which is a significant number. Um, and some of them, including physical uh, specific uh, conditions uh, adapted to the needs of prisoners with mental health disorders. Um, in probation, uh, we also asked if there was any special order or requirement for people with mental disorders and 32% uh, um, answered that um, uh, there is, um, there is um, a special order or requirement, um, law orders, acts or internal guidelines uh, for the treatment um, of, the, of this individuals um, about the collect the, the the collection of data regarding the number of deaths uh, of suicide by suicide um, the major um, it, it's a major difference between prison and probation as we can see 90 percent of the prison administration collects this information but only 40 14 percent of the prison services um, stated that collects this kind of information um, and the other question was about if there is a prison suicide reduction program established in your country or jurisdiction, and this was only um, directed to the prison context. And 89% of the of the countries said that there is in place a, a suicide prevention program inside the prison, and um, this was uh, mentioned to be a, a very important topic with the large positive responsive rates. Um, to conclude in this, as I mentioned, were some uh, figures about the findings, but to conclude and to summarize all the findings, we had a good reaction from, from the member states to the questionnaire. We had about 63% rate of um, responses, which is good, not the ideal situation. We would like to have 100% of the questionnaires that we sent out um, to get feedback from them, but um, until the end of the questionnaire, we received this, um, this rate of responses. After that, we received some contacts from other uh, jurisdictions that did not comply with them, um, did not fulfill the, the, the questionnaire, but want to add um, information to, the, to, the, to this uh, um, research in order to provide us with some more information. Um, but from this, uh, from the responses that we had, we also can highlight that training and raising awareness on mental health disorders is provided for all prison staff in many countries, 74% of them. Nevertheless, in, in probation, the coverage is smaller as we see, as we saw, 33%. The, import the importance of research on the prevalence of mental health disorders among inmates in order to better knowledge the specific needs of this population 62% of the answers um, show that it's very important um, that the, the, to invest in further research for the prevalence of mental health disorders. Um, and by far the most common model for probation clients to access mental health care was through the use of external healthcare agencies, 80% of the responses and 10% exit access um, services in the voluntary section, sector. Um, another finding is that the, uh, an increase in shared responsibilities between the Ministry of Justice and the Ministry, the Ministry of Health in the treatment of inmates with mental disorders. 66% 66, 66 of the um, prison administration uh, demonstrated that there is this increasing um, co-responsibility investment um, with the Ministry of Health. In the, in, the, in the providing care to this uh, population. Most probation responses indicated that the role of probation services was to direct probationers to external services. Um, and most prison organization provide treatment themselves, but also invite external services, mainly specialists, as well refers to health services in the community. So the community, uh, links and um, the work with the community-based uh, health uh, um, services is very important, uh, both for prison and probation context. Um, we also found that the um, existence of special units 
with physical conditions and human resources specialized in the accommodation and care of inmates with mental health disorder and disability. 69% of the prison um, responses say that they have this different and specialized interventional multidisciplinary teams. Uh, we found a very impressive rate of positive responses to the collect of data related to suicide behavior in the prison context, as well as the existence, the existence of suicidal prevention programs and strategies also inside prison services. Um, and to conclude, a good responsive rate referring to the work with the community in resettlement plans that was also another question. And so these were the main findings of this questionnaire. Uh, this questionnaire um, and these are the areas that we are going to cover in the, um, the white paper that it's um, under, under construction, um, as I mentioned, and uh, that uh, is now in the phase of integrating all the contributions and the conclusions of all the, um, the findings of this survey. And uh, to conclude, what are the, the challenges for the future? And this is a, a more a more wide uh, perspective. So we know from research that there are. Th this is a very complex theme. We know from this questionnaire that this is a, um, a hot topic that we should invest um, in, in um, a better understanding of the phenomenon, a better understanding of the context in order to provide better interventions. And so uh, we also know that this mental health in prison and probation um, requires a multidisciplinary approach um, to face the, the different needs and the different risks that this individual presents to, um, to our system. Not only security needs, not only medical needs, but also criminogenic needs and social needs. Um, and so for that, we need also an integrated and comprehensive rehabilitation approach also to this um, kind of um, this specific target group of individuals with mentally with mental disorders both in prison and probation services but that have committed some um, crimes and some uh, facts that are uh, considered crimes and so the re rehabilitation um, uh, needs um, complex uh, um, responses and programs um, in this multidisciplinary perspective. And so um, this is a final slide just to, um, to present the, the, this complex uh, um, set of responses, um, more, one more uh, cognitive approach, one more cognitive based approach programs, um, other programs more behavioral, practical um, based, uh, interventions and uh, um, complete a complete reintegration uh, process and resettlement program process planned um, is essential to um, to have the success and to provide change in the future of these offenders and to provide of course a better future for all of us so thank you for your attention well, thank you very much, Jorge, for this very interesting presentation. And I think we're all looking forward to the white paper. I think the, the research showed how uh, important the issue is within uh, uh, not only probation, but also prison. Uh, I think it's good that it's on the agenda of the Council of Europe. Uh, and it's a pleasure for me to introduce um, Jake, Jake Phillips. He is uh, for 10 years now a lecturer in criminology at Sheffield Hallam. Uh, university and Jake is involved in um, um, well delivering core cor and optional modules on criminology programs as well as supervising dissertation students and conducting research. But prior to coming Sheffield to Hallam, Hallam, he was at the University of Cambridge, where he completed his PhD, which examined the culture of probation, which I think uh, is something for uh, another webinar. Um, uh, in Cambridge, Jack, Jake also conducted research into death under probation supervision, which is the topic of his presentation. Um, he also 
worked uh, in various roles in the criminal justice system. He worked with offenders in the community and he has in different times focused on employment, training and education, drug using offenders and housing support to uh, Jake, the floor is yours. Um, so I'm Jake Phillips, uh, reader in criminology, uh, Sheffield Hallam University. I'm going to talk today about suicide in probation, building on and, and uh, adding some, I think, practice focused observations, I think, to the two previous uh, presentations. Um, so hopefully there'll be some nice alignment between what I'm going to say uh, and what we've already heard about. Um, just to say what I'm going to present today is not all my own work. Um, I've done various bits of research uh, with people, uh, including Colette Barry, who's at Ulster University, uh, and also Juliet Mullen, Lorraine Gelsop and Nikki Padfield, all of whom are uh, at Cambridge. So just to acknowledge their, their role in this. So I'm going to um, start by just thinking about why we should think about suicide in the context of probation. Um, the previous two speakers have already uh, covered some of that, which is always good. So I can save it a little bit of time there. Then I'm going to look at some data on the prevalence of suicide uh, amongst people who are under probation supervision, look at some risk factors, and then draw on some research that we've just completed uh, with staff around how they assess and manage the risk of suicide amongst people. Um, on the caseload. If we've got time, I'll then touch a little bit on what those participants in our research said about the impact on them, uh, because working in probation with people who are at risk of suicide takes a toll on staff, uh, which I think probation services should remember uh, about too. So why, do, why should we think about suicide in probation? So as the previous speakers have already touched on around the world um, where analysis has been conducted and where data exists, uh, rates of suicide are found to be relatively high amongst people under probation supervision when compared with the general population and also in some cases when compared with people in prison too. We know that the rate of suicide amongst people in prison is also high uh, and in England and Wales, at least everybody who spends time in prison then spends time uh, in the community under probation supervision for quite how long depends uh, on the sentence. Um, and so it's important to understand what those um, what the impact that longer term impact of being in prison is uh, on people as they transition. Uh, back into the community. We know that being on probation, being under supervision creates, uh, you know, inflicts pain on people. There's a, you know, a body of evidence around the pains of probation, the pains of uh, penal supervision. Uh, and there are certain elements of probation supervision, which staff argue and, and I would argue create kind of, well, I suppose exacerbate some of the risks uh, that already exists and makes those risks different um, to the risks that we see uh, with people in prison. And so we need to understand that. Not only is probation painful, it's also becoming increasingly pervasive, uh, increasingly intrusive, controlling uh, in people's lives. Uh, it can result in greater isolation, sense of liminality, and so on. There are also some really important and difficult questions around where a duty of care lies um, for probation services. Um, so probation services can't be held as accountable as prison um, because they have much less control over people's lives. They're not in 24 seven contact with them. People are not being kept uh, in detention. But nonetheless, they do have some kind of responsibility to look after people. Probation service in England and Wales, at least, assesses not only risk to others, risk of reoffending, risk of harm to others, but they also assess risk to self. And so if probation services are assessing risk to self, that implies at least that they've got some responsibility for managing and reducing that risk. What is the role of human rights legislation? Um, you know, human rights legislation gives everybody the right to um, right to life, um, the right to safety. Um, should probation services be held um, to similar standards 
uh, to prison and so on. I think that in order to answer those questions, we need a really good understanding of the causes of uh, suicide, or at least the, the, some of the factors that are relevant to suicide amongst people under probation supervision. So I'm going to draw on four research projects, primarily the bottom two, the more recent two. So as Villa mentioned, 2010, we did some research funded by the Howard League for Penal Reform. That's where I started my interest uh, in this topic. Uh, we then did some research in 2016, funded by the Equality and Human Rights Commission, looking specifically at people who died after release from detention, and that was prison and police uh, detention. And then we've just completed, like I said, a piece of research funded by the Inspectorate of Probation, uh, looking at staff experiences of working with people at risk of suicide and or self-harm. It's a bit of a mouthful. And the report for that uh, is due out um, towards the end of next month. So keep a lookout for that. And then we've also done some work looking at um, mortality ratios amongst people on probation, uh, which I'll look at uh, today. So um, the data here, all of this data is fairly Anglo Welsh centric, I'm afraid, but I'm interested to hear how things work in other jurisdictions. So just some headline figures, I suppose, for England and Wales. Um, England and Wales collect data on people who die whilst under probation supervision, and they've published it since 2010. The quality of those data are questionable, um, although I would argue they're improving and, and people we've spoken to seem to suggest that they are more accurate now uh, than they used to be. There is a process which probation officers have to follow if somebody on the caseload dies, which results in the Ministry of Justice collate, collating and publishing those figures on an annual basis. So in the year 2021, uh, we saw 1,343 people die whilst under probation supervision from any cause. Uh, and that includes people serving a community sanction, so a community order, a suspended sentence order, or people who are under probation supervision in the community following re release from prison. Of those 1,343, 409 were self-inflicted, so around a third, um, around 40% of women who died, died from a self-inflicted death, and 29% of men who died did so from a self-inflicted death. We just need to be careful about uh, the definition of self-inflicted death here, it's not the same as suicide. Um, so the burden of proof is not, uh, for, a, for a probation officer to tick self-inflicted death is not uh, as high as that required for a coroner's court to come to a suicide verdict. How probation officers come to that conclusion is kind of based on what they know about the circumstances uh, of the death. So they might be informed by a family member or a healthcare professional or um, any institution that somebody's died and they'll be giving an indication of how uh, that person died. If that person was suspected of dying at their own hand, then they'll be put down as a self-inflicted death. Now, up until 2019-20, this self-inflicted deaths category included people who died from a drug overdose. Since 2019 and 2020, probation staff have been asked to put, if so if they know somebody died from a drug overdose, um, to put that into a separate category. Um, so previously, self-inflicted death was being artificially inflated by including drug overdose deaths. We've now got data uh, which is separated, which makes it much more uh, helpful. So self-inflicted deaths here are not suicides. I think probably the most accurate definition will be suspected suicides, and it excludes accidental drug overdoses. But we need to be careful. So 30% of people who died did so from a self-inflicted death. But the probation, which is much higher than we see in the general population, uh, so we need to control for certain factors uh, when we're actually trying to work out the prevalence uh, of suicides or self-inflicted deaths amongst the caseload. And we can see why we need to do this when we look at this graph on the left here. So this is a graph showing the age profile of the general population, uh, which is the light grey, uh, and then the probation caseload, uh, the dark grey. And we can see here 
that the uh, probation caseloads, as you would expect, is much younger than the general population. So, you know, well over half uh, of the probation caseload is under 50, uh, whereas in the general population, it's much more evenly spread. We know that suicide is higher amongst uh, men. We know that suicide is highest amongst men aged in the age brackets 30 to 40 and 40 to 50. And we can see, we know already, don't we, that people on probation uh, are much more likely to be men. And we can see here that they are also very likely to be in their 30s and their 40s. So we would expect a suicide rate amongst probation to be high and certainly higher than the general population if we just look at crude mortality rates. So in order to overcome some of these problems, we did some analysis to calculate age standardized mortality ratios. So this is the ratio between the observed, the actual number of deaths in a cohort. Uh, so how many people under probation die from a self-inflicted death and uh, compare that with the number of deaths that would be expected if it had the same age profile as the general population. So that enables us to compare the rates of death amongst different populations that have different uh, age profiles. So we did this in order to, um, we did this by um, collecting data from the ONS around um, uh, risks of dying from self-inflicted death, suicide um, risks. Uh, and we also requested data from the Ministry of Justice around how many people within each age bracket are on uh, the probation caseload. So we did a, what's called indirect uh, standardization. Uh, and this table shows the results of those analysis. So we're interested here in self-inflicted deaths. Uh, all of the uh, ratios, um, which are the numbers to the left of the brackets, are statistically significant apart from uh, women dying um, from homicide uh, and women dying from accidents. Uh, so there was basically too few numbers of people dying from those uh, causes of death um, to ascertain statistical significance. Um, so we can see then that for men and women dying from a self-inflicted death, they are 7.4 times more likely to die from a self-inflicted death than the same people in the general population of the same age. Um, and that's across different types of supervision. Um, so all forms of supervision, court orders and post-release. Uh, and it's across both genders. But we can see for women, it is particularly high. And it's particularly high amongst women who have been released from prison. So women released from prison are 19.7 times more likely to die from a self-inflicted death mm. than um, people in the general population. I suppose we should also be interested in um, the, the, the rows at the bottom on uh, drug overdoses. We couldn't break that down uh, by gender, but we can see a very high uh, standardised mortality ratio for when men and women dying from drug overdoses. Um, when under probation supervision. So what that does is it serves to reinforce other analyses that have been undertaken from around the world. It updates analysis that was done in 2002. That was the, the, that was the last time that somebody um, calculated ASMRs for uh, probation in England and Wales. Um, and it also breaks things down by uh, sentence type, uh, which hasn't been done before. So why so high? I suppose we should ask ourselves. And I think we've had, you know, the answer to that um, already to a degree. Um, we, you know, this uh, list of factors associated with high suicide risk in the general population was taken from a government uh, website. Um, and lots of the things on here we would well expect to be um, disproportionately or very prevalent amongst people under probation supervision. So we know now, thanks to the previous speakers, that mental illness is, you know, very high amongst people under probation supervision. But we also see things like social isolation. People under probation supervision are more likely to feel socially isolated, stigmatised, excluded from society, especially people serving uh, sentences for certain types of uh, offences. In the research we did for the Equality and Human Rights Commission a few years ago, we found that 
people who had been arrested or, or convicted of a sex offence seemed to be more likely to die uh, following release from detention. And we would postulate that that's because of the stigma and the exclusion that emanates from that kind of sentencing and conviction. Criminal problems, um, well, that almost becomes a tautology. Uh, financial problems, we know there's, you know, body of research now coming out around how people under supervision experience debt and how debt can be a barrier to desistance and successful reintegration. We know that people who are convicted of a crime are more likely to show impulsive or aggressive uh, tendencies. Um, we know that being having, an, uh, having a conviction makes it more difficult to find a job uh, because of the need to disclose uh, convictions. Um, we also know that people who end up in the criminal justice system are more likely to be to have lower educational attainment, which makes getting a job uh, more difficult. High levels of substance use, we've heard already amongst the caseload, adverse childhood experiences, trauma, relationship problems, all of these things we would expect to see as particularly prevalent amongst the probation caseload. So, so we would expect to see, even once we've you know, controlled for age and gender, we'd expect to see a relatively high rate of suicide amongst the probation caseload. I suppose the question is, is that rate higher even than we would expect when we take all of these additional factors into account? That kind of analysis is beyond my capabilities and I suspect we don't really have the data um, to be able to ascertain it anyway, but I would like somebody to, to find out. In addition to those kind of general risk factors, there are things about being on probation which I would argue exacerbate some of those risks. Uh, so drawing on research that we've done, but also um, by others in the field of probation in England and Wales, uh, we've found that new legal proceedings can increase the risk of somebody um, certainly feeling suicidal uh, and, and uh, actually attempting or successfully taking their own life. Uh, so the threat of recall, the threat of breach, that transition from custody into the community increases the risk uh, of suicide. Uh, so again, in the research we did for the Equality and Human Rights Commission, uh, and if you look at the data that comes out from the Ministry of Justice, um, the risk of dying is highest in the first few weeks and then it, it, it drops off and then levels out uh, once you get beyond one or two months post-release. Being on probation necessarily involves in some cases restrictions and limited access to family, other sources of support in the community, more often than not due to the risk that people are deemed to pose, that can create greater feelings of social isolation and then experiences of trauma, mm. uh, which I've already mentioned. So we've got a situation where the probation caseload comes already to probation, more likely to with you know a high number of those risk factors, which we know are correlated with a high risk of suicide, and then additional things from probation kind of layered on top. I don't want to go into this in a lot of detail, but I think it's worth just thinking about this in terms of a model of uh, suicidal behaviour. So the integrated motiv motivational volitional model by Rory O'Connor and colleagues uh, basically shows that suicidal behaviour is the result of a complex interplay of a range of factors which occur at different uh, times. So we've got uh, the kind of the background factors, so people's lives, their environment, where they grow up, experiences and that kind of stuff. Um, but then uh, people move into the motivational phase as a result of certain moderators. So motivational moderators, threat to self uh, moderators. And you can see these things. Um, uh, you, you know, you can see how being under probation supervision is likely to increase the chances of some of these things, these moderators occurring within people's lives. Uh, and then you know, uh, those volitional moderators, such as having access to means, might also increase 
as one um, is, you know, perhaps moves from prison to the community environment, it becomes easier to access uh, the means for uh, suicide. I think it's important to say that, okay, suicide is high amongst people on the probation caseload, but to go back to that point previously around, you know, what's the role of probation services here, we need to remember that suicide risk is hard to assess. Um, it's, you know, the Royal College of Psychiatrists published a report a couple of years ago saying that, you know, just relying on risk factor identification is not enough, that, that fails clinicians, it fails patients. Demographic factors cannot predict suicide risk uh, accurately and should not be relied upon. It requires lots of knowledge, it requires skills, it requires an in-depth understanding of suicide and of the person in order to accurately predict and, and assess, uh, you know, do a clinical risk assessment. Uh, and I think we need to remember that, you know, is it fair to be asking probation officers to be doing that? Well, I don't think it is. And the probation officers that we spoke to uh, would agree. Suicide is the culmination of a complex range of factors which interact in different ways for different people. Uh, and we need to remember that. Nevertheless, uh, probation officers do and are asked to assess the risk of suicide. Um, the ones that we spoke to said, yeah, we do do that. We've got some risk assessment tools, but they also stressed oh, time and time again that they're not mental health practitioners. Um, they all wanted more training. Um, and it's interesting in the previous slide there to see, you know, that training for people on probation is much lower than um, in prisons, uh, but they also don't and cannot be uh, the experts. People talk to us about how they assess risk. And one of the key ways was around obtaining information um, ahead of, you know, somebody's release or ahead of like that induction session when they're first sentenced. But people talked about how that is incredibly difficult, especially for people leaving prison. So accessing information from health care in prisons was very difficult. Now, yes, there are ethical issues around sharing information and so on. Accessing, so in England and Wales, we've got a system called ACT, which is used to manage the risk of um, suicide in prison. And probation officers said that they don't get access to the information um, from ACT documentation from prisons. Um, people said that, you know, what they need to be able to do to assess risk is have a good working relationship with their uh, service users, but that requires a lot of time to develop, and that's very difficult in the context of high workloads. In terms of managing risk, um, in hostels, we talked to people who worked in hostels, and this seemed to us to kind of amount to, in lots of ways, kind of situational crime prevention. So regular observations, removing potentially harmful objects, controlling access uh, to medication. In the community, people talked about it in a fairly managerial way. So if people are talking about suicidal, su su suicidal ideation, self-harm, you put a little flag on Delius, that's the case management system that probation uses, and that's almost it. Or at least that's all you have to do. You can try and refer them into mental health if you can, um, but it has to be external, again, reflecting some of the findings from the survey that we just heard about. Some staff talked about giving service users harm minimization um, advice, so how to self-harm more safely um, and so on. Uh, but generally, people said in the community, it's very difficult to manage that risk and to support people, partly because of the lack of regular contact uh, that people have, but also... Uh, just because of the lack of services that are available, uh, cuts to mental health services and so on. So in the community, you're on your own. We just have to Google mental health services in the borough that someone lives in, one of our probation officers told us. There's also this tension which probation officers experience between supporting resettlement and kind of greater uh, independence. Um, people talked about... Uh, meaningful conversations and having kind of informal ad hoc intervention uh, with people. And in some areas, there was arrangements for mental health practitioner to come into the probation setting to provide support and treatment. This was mainly in hostels. It was very ad hoc. It was very much dependent on individual professional relationships. 
So staff don't really feel trained in supporting people at risk of suicide. Um, they felt vulnerable in being asked uh, to do that. Um, arrangements for mental health, mental health practitioners to come into probation was not very widespread. Uh, and there's a real issue with under-resourced community mental health provision. So what can we do about it? Well, I think that, you know, if we look at the evidence about protective factors for suicide, we can actually see lots of things that probation can do here that's not necessarily around um, that kind of medical model of rehabilitation that we heard about at the end of the um, previous presentation. You know, if people have good connections to friends and family and community support that acts as a, as a protective factor against uh, suicide. If people have supportive relationships with care providers that can act as uh, a protective factor against suicide. Probation officers can do those things. They don't need to be mental health providers in order to do it. Yes, it can't be the only thing. There needs to be availability to physical and mental health care. People need to have support with improving their coping and problem solving skills, but there's stuff that probation can do kind of outside that kind of medical model. Conscious of time, so I'm gonna really quickly skip over these just to say the staff we spoke to um, said that it's very difficult when somebody on the caseload dies. People who work in hostels talked about the impact and the enduring impact uh, that it has. Um, support from the organization when people do die was very variable, very contingent on the manager. Um, and often support was found from colleagues instead of uh, the organization. People felt blamed a lot by post-death investigations. So that raises questions then about how and the extent to which probation services should be held to account. A lot of paperwork when somebody dies uh, and people don't like that, understandably. So just to conclude, uh, people on probation experience many risks that are associated with suicide and being under probation supervision exacerbates some of those risks. There are things that can be done, but that's limited in the context of high workloads. We've got to remember that assessing the risk of suicide is hard. Probation officers find it difficult and they're not trained to do it. They're not psychiatrists, they're not psychologists, they're not CPNs. The options for managing risk are limited, um, but there is stuff uh, which probation probably could do beyond and outside that kind of fairly medical uh, model. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I'm going to stop it there. If anyone's got any questions, please do feel free to ask. Okay, thank you very much, Jake, for a very interesting presentation and for I think a subject we don't know that much about. So I think people find it very interesting. What struck me is the uh, you mentioned the lack of knowledge that education and training is needed on mental health in the, in our sector. Um, yeah, it's now time for uh, some questions and answers. Uh, Anna, yes, can, yes. You, can you? Yes, I'm going now uh, to a few questions and answers. First of all, okay. I would like to first of all I would like to thank you all very much for your interesting and insightful presentations. I actually always find it very useful to share knowledge on the same topic from different perspectives and different jurisdictions. So. Yeah, really interesting what it was mentioned on interagency cooperation, importance of training, and also the gender perspective uh, included in the data analysis. Sometimes a forgotten perspective, but uh, very important and actually a key factor to be considered when developing a specific treatment programs and yeah, and treatments. So thank you all. As Willem said, now it's time for Q&A. I can see that there are a few questions. So the first question for Dr. Damien Smith is, I'm going to uh, read them out loud. Do you think all issues of a prisoner with mental health issues who is homeless and is on drugs can be addressed together or as individual issues, one at a time? Uh, thanks, Anna. Uh, so, yeah, the, I, I think this particular question is something that we may all be familiar with. Uh, unfortunately, as, as has been touched upon, resourcing of community mental health services has been decimated over recent years and decades, really. Um, and uh, here in Ireland, 
it's particularly difficult for those who have these comorbidities to access standard community-based mental health services. For example, if you're actively using drugs, uh, a community mental health team may tell you to go and address that issue in the first instance before they can properly assess your mental state and provide a, a diagnosis or a treatment. Um, so that, that can lead to these individuals being kind of marginalized from community mental health teams. I think it is important though that these individuals uh, are provided with care uh, given how, you know, how, how much morbidity uh, and we, as we know, mortality, mortality they can face. Um, so I think there is a need for more inclusive mental health services in the community that provide kind of, I suppose, support uh, on an assertive basis um, rather than uh, excluding people. But that, that's kind of easy for me to say, working in a prison. Um, I have also worked in community mental health teams um, in the community and I know how difficult it can be because you know when you're not resourced uh, adequately you've got really busy clinics and then someone shows up who's intoxicated maybe aggressive it can be incredibly difficult to to you know to provide them with care at that time and um, so I you know I think Mark alluded to it early on in this talk but in Ireland we have been looking at a uh, working with Department of Justice and Department of Health to try and address the kind of barriers to care for released mentally ill prisoners who often have these complex comorbidities. And one of the things that we would have been advocating for is the provision of more, uh, in, I suppose, inclusion-based mental health services, particularly in our urban centers where these homeless mentally ill individuals tend to, tend to congregate. Um, and often don't fit in with with standard mental health services so um i don't know hopefully that address it maybe in a very long-winded way but um and i see coming in another question for you and it says do you think psychiatric symptoms which can decrease with rock abstinence naturally are confounding factors for psychiatric disorders prevalence? Um, so do I think that psychiatric symptoms that decrease following abstinence from substance abuse confound psychiatric disorder prevalence? Yeah, um, I suppose, you know, look, we, we do see, particularly in prison psychiatry, we see people who come in straight off the street that you know, may have been using substances, they present with you know, very florid psychiatric symptoms, mainly psychotic symptoms. And then, you know, we, we observe them over time, uh, sometimes before we intervene with medication and to see if the symptoms resolve following resolution of intoxication and withdrawal. Sometimes it won't. Um, and then we may diagnose a drug-induced psychotic episode, uh, or if it's more pervasive than that, lasting greater than six weeks, for example, we may look at diagnosing a more primary psychotic illness. Um, you know, so in, in the community as well, that can be more difficult to do because, you know, uh, people may be actively using uh, drugs. And can that confound... Uh, the, and, and what increased maybe the, the prevalence of mental disorders? Um, possibly, uh, but I, I think in prevalence studies, this is usually taken into account. Um, they're usually performed using structured diagnostic instruments. Um, and that usually takes into account whether the symptoms occur immediately after drug use or in the context of drug use and then the diagnosis would be different you know it would be more of a, a drug induced syndrome rather than uh, a primary mental health disorder 
Now we are going to move to Mr. Jorge Monteiro. I have two questions for him. The first question um, is for you, Jorge, but also perhaps uh, Mr. Jake Phillips uh, uh, will have something to say. And the question says, are there differences in the number of suicides between pretrial detention and criminal detention? Okay, so in, in our research in the, in the, um, the survey, we didn't um, reach out for the, um, for the concrete rates of suicide. So we just, the question was about the, if the, the administrations or jurisdictions were conducting uh, um, assessments, uh, and if so, in which phase? In, uh, during the, the judicial uh, um, process or phase or during imprisonment and in which phase of imprisonment. So we did not um, reach for those, um, for those uh, numbers, probably um, Jake Phillips have. So I don't have the, the, the data to hand, but uh, yeah, people on remand are generally seen to face an elevated risk uh, of suicide, but I don't know by how much. I don't know. Mm -hmm. I don't know the figures, but um, there was an article published really recently by Philippa Tomjak looking at remand prisoners, focusing, I think, on the investigation of the deaths of remand prisoners. But I imagine in there, um, there's something useful. If I get a minute, I'll look it up. I'll be able to find it fairly easily and I'll pop it in the chat. <laughs> oh, super, super. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm going to go for the next question for Mr. Jorge Montero. The question is, um, well, I guess that all the speakers will have something to say, but uh, it says, how could the human rights of people on probation who have mental health disorders be better advanced and supported? What is the potential role or implications for human rights law in this area of probation? And what more could probation inspectorates and human rights scrutiny bodies do? I, I think that um, the human rights perspective is always important. The human rights inspectorates um, and those who are um, promoting the human rights of all the um, of all the probationers, but not only, also the, the prison, the prisoners. Um, it's it's very important role because um, and the way that we can improve the human rights of these individuals is by um, by knowing better the um, their conditions, uh, um, conduct more research about the the phenomenon, about the real context of um, of the probationers, the, um, their own individual needs um, in order to provide care and specialized care and um, differentiated interventions. So I think this is the way to promote the, the human rights of these individuals, uh, the probationers and the prisoners is to uh, better uh, to um, re conduct research, further research in order to better know uh, um, the, the symptoms in order to um, improve the interventions? It's a, it's a really interesting question. It's something that we've kind of grappled with uh, over the years. I think there's definitely a role for human rights kind of legislation here. Um, if you think about it through the lens of kind of institutional violence, are, is the state doing enough to protect people from risk to self when they leave prison? And I think that's probably the, the most obvious yeah. place uh, to look at this. Um, then if you ask that question and your answer is no, <laughs> um, probably not, uh, it's not providing sufficient services, notwithstanding the great practice that we've heard about uh, today, but, you know, on the whole, um, people leaving prison face really high risks uh, of suicide, then I think that human rights legislation can be used to kind of leverage uh, some uh, power and some change there it's in England and Wales the prisons and probation ombudsman is responsible for investigating deaths in custody and they've recently expanded their remit to do more investigations of people who die following release from prison um, so they're not going to be article 2 compliant investigations like they are in custody um, but they are going to be um, carried out more frequently 
uh, and with more rigor than investigations currently are carried out. And I think that's a really positive thing because then we can use those investigations to learn more about what it is and what might be causing uh, these uh, the high risk of uh, suicide amongst the caseload. Two questions to be answered. One is specifically for Mr. Jake Phillips and the other one is for Mr. Damian Smith. I will go for the one for Mr. Jake Phillips and it's about managing the risk of suicide in the community. You mentioned that family or friends could act as protective factors, but when they are not a protective factor, how can they be uh, helped or how can they be accompanied to become a protective factor? I think this probably speaks to what we probably want probation officers to do, which is work with people holistically, work with them and their families. I, you know, I don't want to look back, you know, on the olden days with rose tinted spectacles and think that probation in the 60s and 70s was amazing. Um, but they, but probation did used to work, you know, with with people and their families. And I think if probation officers were given the time, the flexibility um, to do more of that, then I think they could probably work much more effectively with the family to enable the family to become a protective factor. We need to be careful of using families in that way. Families shouldn't be co-opted by the criminal justice system to manage risk. Um, but, you know, I think that if probation officers were allowed that bit more flexibility there, then it would, then it would certainly help. Okay, thank you, Jake. And now the last question to doc, uh, yeah, Dr. Damian and says, here in Athens, Portugal, we are witnessing a growing phenomenon with high impact on people's mental health and most of them linked to the justice system, which is the consumption of new synthetic drugs. How is it, how is it possible to reintegrate someone into society when there are no answers from the National Health Service nor effective rehabilitation treatments for this problem. Emergency psychiatrists are unable to identify what type of illicit substance is under the influence, so they cannot provide an adequate response. This situation makes it difficult for the professionals who accompany those on probation to intervene. Yeah, um, uh, this is, this is uh, I think, a growing problem across Europe, if yeah. not the world. Um, novel psychoactive substances are, are becoming more prevalent in, uh, in our community, but also in the prisons where I work, unfortunately. Um, now that I suppose how, how best to reintegrate people and address the rehabilitation needs for these particular substances, that's a tricky one, yeah. I, I don't know of any programs for this, these particular substances, but in my experience, and, and it may just be in my own experience, most people with, uh, who use these drugs are also using other substances as well. Um, so just maybe a more holistic approach to addressing their addiction needs through counseling or, or, or drug rehabilitation uh, may, may be their approach to take. Um, but they are, they are a growing concern. Uh, and you're right, most standard drug screening tests don't identify them. Um, you have to send to particular labs that can be costly uh, and take time. Um, although I know we're coming up to the festival season and I know that there seems to be some, uh, you know, voluntary organizations that go in and do actually do uh, on the spot testing for particular substances to identify them uh, as part of kind of harm minimization strategies. So, so maybe there are going to be more things coming on stream that we can use to test for these substances uh, and identify if they're the causative agent for someone's uh, pres presentation with mental health problems. Um, again, I, I don't think I have a specific answer to address it or satisfy it, but Look, I, I, I empathize. It's a, it's a challenging, challenging uh, situation. Well, thank you all for your questions and thank you all for your answers. <clears throat> Bilam, over to you now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, before I will close the webinar, I'd like to give the floor to uh, CP President Jerry McNally.
to reflect on uh, uh, this webinar, the presentations. We Thank you, Willem. So, I think we've had a very rich conversation this morning. I think certainly the papers have stimulated a lot of discussion and questions. And I think that reflects the, both the importance of the topic, but also the importance of actually addressing it now and in, into the future. I think certainly the presentation uh, that, from Damien Smith on the ethics certainly has raised a lot of questions and it came up in the in, in the in the in the chat afterwards about human rights and the protection of rights and the respect for people and how we manage that it also posed the issues of around confidentiality and particularly the importance of how we're going to work in partnership across agencies because i don't think this is a mental health is going to be a multidisciplinary challenge and it's going to take a multidisciplinary response and i do think that certainly brings it up harke in his presentation certainly uh, highlighted the um, challenges that are going to be needed to actually make those things work in practice certainly highlighting the importance of skills and competency and the needs for the need for training but also the need for data gathering and again repeating the importance of this cross agency and community links cross agency cooperation and community links so really it's very much about joined up services about pooling our expertise and working together not just with the individual but with the communities and with the other professionals and i was particularly struck in, in jake's presentation uh, almost by his final question which was what are we going to do about it because he certainly highlighted the uh, challenges in suicide he's identified it, the problem he certainly um, identified the weaknesses in our data gathering again the, and the limitations in our knowledge and I do think we know where if we're going to be helping people to manage these risks, we're going to need to develop our expertise, but we're and to work across services. But again, we are going to need to learn more, to share more and to work together better. And I think that's the overall message I've had from this morning is there is a need for an increased level of training. There's an increase a need for an increased level of research and data gathering, and we've got to be working closer and more integrated in a more integrated fashion together across the disciplines. I do hope today's um, webinar is the, the next step in a, in an ongoing piece of work that we're going to be doing with CEP and with probation professionals and with uh, our criminal justice colleagues and our medical colleagues because uh, across Europe and across the world this is a burning issue it's an issue for today and it's an issue that we need to be paying attention to and I think we're going to need to do a lot more work and a lot more development in this as I mentioned in the beginning CEP is embarking on a research project on, a develop, on, on skills and competencies among probation professionals. And I do hope everyone will be able to assist us in that. But I do think it certainly reflects the direction of travel that has been identified here this morning in today's presentation. So I think uh, we need to work on that. We need to develop that. And I do, as I say, this is a an early step and an early part of our journey. I'm sure this is going to be one we'll be working with in the future. So I hope we'll look forward to meeting you all again um, at a future date so we can make further progress and work together in addressing this very important theme and topic. So again, thank you for your participation today. I look forward to hearing more from you in the future and I look forward to actually working together to make progress. So thank you again and back to you, Willem. Okay, thank you, Jerry. Thank you, Jerry. Yeah, as you said, this is perhaps just the beginning. Um, one of the conclusions uh, for me is that definitely this webinar needs to have a follow up. Um, uh, but of course, I'd like to thank Damien Smith and Jorge Montero and Jake Phillips for their excellent presentations. And also like to thank Mark Wilson and Jerry for their opening address and Jerry, especially for his closing words. Um, as mentioned, and we have seen that questions also in, in the chat, the, all the presentations will be available on the CP website uh, at short notice for your reference. And this webinar was also recorded, so most probably we will put the recordings of the presentations on our YouTube channel as well. So keep track on our social media. 
Uh, and of course, I also want to come and thank all participants for their attendance. And um, uh, finally, I'd like to thank my CP staff members, uh, Ms. Miriam van der Kooi and Anna Esquerra Doketta, who work behind and also uh, uh, in the scene, but also they're always in control and dedicated to make uh, uh, this online event to a success. So ladies and gentlemen, on behalf of the Confederation of European Probation, once again, I thank you for joining this CP webinar. Have a nice afternoon and stay safe.